Okay. Right, thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, and yes, the relationship of Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. Um, always a fast moving field and I've uh, had to edit my slides in the last few days even for this one. So, uh, so let's see how it goes. So everyone's pretty well agreed that today there is only one human species, Homo sapiens, also known as modern humans. And of course we come in many different sizes, shapes and colors. But if we strip away all those superficial features and look at the skeleton underneath, then we share as a species a number of fundamental features in our skeleton. Um, and these are things we can look for in the fossil record, obviously to trace back the evolution of our species. And sorry for this bit of technical stuff here, but um, I'm going to introduce a new usage into this talk. Um, the problem is that for about 50 years, we've been talking about anatomically modern Homo sapiens, obviously shortened often to modern Homo sapiens. And we hear about behaviorally modern Homo sapiens. And these terms inevitably get confused and they're loaded with extra baggage, really. So I'm going to try in the future to move away from the term modern humans, at least for the fossils. Um, I'm going to talk about apomorphic Homo sapiens. So apomorphic means having specialized traits that are unique to a group or species. This is a term from cladistic uh, analyses. And that means this is uh, apomorphic is showing characters not present in an ancestral form. And the other end of that story, the, other, the opposite of apomorphic is plesiomorphic, having ancestral traits. And in the future, I'm gonna try and use this term for what I previously called archaic or primitive homo sapiens, because both of those terms also come with their own unfortunate social baggage. So thus I'll be talking about apomorphic homo sapiens for what I used to call modern homo sapiens and plesiomorphic homo sapiens for what I used to call archaic homo sapiens. So when we strip down our morphology to the skeleton, we've certainly got a number of uh, distinctive features compared with uh, other groups that we see in the fossil record. So in our skeleton, we have a higher narrow rib cage, a narrow, less flared pelvis. Our joint surfaces are generally smaller. We've got a lighter build with, with lighter muscle markings and so on. And in the skull and jaw, we've also got a number of distinctive features. So that high and rounded brain case, with upper parietal expansion, a weak or non-existent brow ridge, a flat midface, delicate cheekbones, distinct ear bone shapes, a narrow base to the skull, quite small front teeth, uh, and quite a strong chin, even in, uh, even in children. So these are features we can look for in the fossil record to trace the evolution, the origins of our species, Homo sapiens. And in my view, the oldest fossil that shows an assemblage of features that I would call apomorphic Homo sapiens, or they used to call modern Homo sapiens, is this fossil from Homo kibish in Ethiopia. And it's recently been dated to at least 233,000 years old uh, from overlying volcanic deposits. So if we look at the reconstructed cranium, there's certainly a lot of reconstruction there, but the shape of the skull is certainly high and rounded. It certainly has upper parietal expansion, large mastoid processes, uh, there's a chin on the lower jaw, uh, a small divided brow ridge. So all of those are features which I would call apomorphic homo sapiens features. And the skeleton also shows apomorphic homo sapiens features, including in the pelvis, which was actually found much later on than the original material uh, in 2001. As it says here about that pelvic material, it has modern human apomorphies, including a reduced iliac tubercle, the hip bone is within the range of recent human variation for a number of features. So I think at, at more than 230,000 years old, this for me is the oldest known apomorphic Homo sapiens. And for a long time, we thought that the evolution of Homo sapiens in Africa was a, a fairly simple process, a unilinear process, perhaps occurring in one region of Africa. So Homo heidelbergensis, maybe 500,000 years old, gave way to 
early Homo sapiens, specimens like Homo kibishwan and Herto, by about 150 to 200,000 years ago. And then later on, we get to the final forms of Homo sapiens. So that was probably the dominant view for the uh, evolutionary pattern in Africa. But certainly now, I think uh, it, it's been falsified. So we know now that there are fossils which look like they're on the uh, Homo sapiens lineage, which are over uh, 250,000, probably around 300,000 years old from Jebel Hood in Morocco. So this site was uh, originally dug in the 1960s, but it's been excavated more recently. More fossil material has been found, uh, more archeological material, and the site's now better dated. So as it says here, the Ihud fossils currently represent to our knowledge, the most securely dated evidence of the early phase of Homo sapiens evolution in Africa. And they do not simply appear as intermediate between African archaic middle Pleistocene forms, forms that we might call Homo heidelbergensis or Homo rhodesiensis and recent modern humans. So here's a, a reconstruction on the bottom left there, uh, a composite of the Ihud one cranium with uh, a newly discovered mandible from the site. And certainly the face and the jaws and teeth do show some features of Homo sapiens, but the brain case shape is still quite primitive. It's quite elongated. So I would call this a, a plesiomorphic Homo sapiens. And that supposedly ancestral form, Homo heidelbergensis or Homo rhodesiensis, uh, we're also taking a new look at that. Uh, so the Broken Hill fossil, dated now to around 300,000 years old by uh, direct dating on the skull itself. And as it says here in this paper uh, that I was on from a couple of years ago, um, this age estimate raises further questions about the mode of evolution of Homo sapiens in Africa and whether Heidelbergensis rhodesiensis was a direct ancestor of our species. So this much more primitive morphology is um, only around the same age as the Jebel Ichud material. And we now know uh, quite close in age to the much more um, derived morphology we see in Homo kibish one. And not only that, the facial morphology of these big skulls that are assigned to Heidelbergensis or Rhodesiensis, forms like Bodo and Broken Hill. Um, the evidence suggests, and this is from the paper I was on a, a few more years ago, the evidence suggests that the large and non-homo sapiens-like faces of Bodo and Broken Hill represent taxonomic diversity in the African Middle Pleistocene record, which could exclude these large fossils as representatives of an ancestral morph for Homo sapiens. In other words, the facial morphology is derived away from the ancestral form we would expect for Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. Um, we think that, that morphology is probably closer to the morphology of Homo antecessor. So that certainly puts a big question mark to this simple unilinear sequence we used to see we, we thought we could see in Africa. Okay, it just seems to uh, have got stuck here on the slides. Let's just see if we can move it on. Yeah. Uh, and I've been working with people like Eleanor Sherry to build a new view of uh, the evolution of Homo sapiens in Africa, um, what we can call a Pan-African model, uh, sometimes called multi-regional evolution of Homo sapiens, although I think that term is probably uh, one that will confuse it with the multi-regional model more globally. So I prefer a Pan-African model now for Homo sapiens evolution. Um, and here's a quote from Ellie saying that uh, we did not derive in one region of Africa, as is often claimed. Instead, our African ancestors were diverse in form and culture and scattered across the entire continent. Well, I'm not sure about entire, but certainly across much of the African continent. And the model we can talk about for Homo sapiens evolution is shown there on the bottom right, that we have different lineages through time, which at times connect with each other uh, when the environment's allowed it, at other times going in their own way, uh, some of them going extinct, others combining. And the modern morphology, what we call the, the apomorphic Homo sapiens morphology, um, coalescing from a variety of forms in different parts of the African continent. And in my view, Homo sapiens um, really is a name that we can give to the whole lineage 
going back to our common ancestor with the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. So here's a representation of that. So here we have a, a, a derived modern human at the top, an apomorphic Homo sapiens, Cro-Magnon one, and lower down earlier in the lineage, Ichud one, as a plesiomorphic Homo sapiens, um, closer to the common ancestor with the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. And it's not just us and the Neanderthals, of course. There's this great diversity as we go back in time into the middle Pleistocene and even in the late Pleistocene. So in green there, we've got uh, the Homo sapiens lineages on the top left. In the yellow, we've got the Neanderthal lineages. Uh, and we've also got, of course, now from China, uh, Homo longi or Homo daliensis. We've got Floresiensis. We've got Luzonensis uh, surviving into the recent past. So all that diversity uh, was there probably uh, 70,000 years ago, but by 30,000 years ago, most of it had gone and there was only, as far as we know, Homo sapiens left. So one of the outstanding questions, of course, why, why is that? Why are we the only ones left uh, from all this diversity that was there earlier on? So let's take a look at the Neanderthals now. And of course, they, they've had a long-term image problem, um, cartoon at the bottom there. Uh, a couple uh, watching a, a TV series on Neanderthals. The man says, they disappeared thousands of years ago and scientists don't know where to. And the woman says, I suppose not many scientists go to football matches. Um, well, as a scientist who goes to football matches, I, I know what she means. Um, but we can see that Neanderthal image at the top here, um, you know, basically depicted as ape men as sort of missing links in human evolution. And of course, that's something that uh, has been pretty well comprehensively disproved by uh, a, a host of papers, uh, particularly in the last 10 years. And here's just a selection of some of these papers showing the complexity of the evolution of the Neanderthals and the development of ideas about the complexity of their behavior. So, we know now that Neanderthals ranged very widely. They weren't just European. They ranged all the way from Portugal and Gibraltar in the uh, uh, southwest of Europe, right over to uh, Western Asia, to the Lebanon, to Syria, to Israel, to Uzbekistan, at times in Siberia, probably at times in China. So they were a wide ranging species, certainly not just a European species. And they weren't just a cold adapted species. They did live in cooler environments uh, as that central reconstruction shows. But in Italy, 250,000 years ago, uh, we see them alongside straight tusk elephants and hippopotamuses um, from the site of Sacabastori in Italy. So they were an adaptable people, uh, not just living in one kind of environment. And we've seen that shift of image. So on the top right there, this image from 1909 of the Neanderthals pushed into the position of being a sort of missing link between us and the apes. And on the bottom right there, um, this much more human reconstruction from our exhibition in London, uh, done by the Kennis brothers, um, a really recognisably you know, human Neanderthal with, with clearly human characteristics and a human personality projected from that reconstruction. And of course that Neander Valley find, which gave its name to the group Neander Valley Neanderthal, made in 1856 and published in 1857, wasn't the first Neanderthal. We know that now. Um, a Neanderthal child's remains have been found at Ongis in Belgium in 1830. Took a hundred years for that to be recognized as a Neanderthal. And of course, this uh, nicely preserved uh, female Neanderthal had been found in Gibraltar in 1848, blasted out from Forbes Quarry. And it took another 15 years for that to be recognized as something distinctive and related to the find from the Neander Valley. And of course that Neander Valley find is the one that in a sense uh, dominates the, the early part of the story because William King in 1863 uh, wrote a report in which he named that Neanderthal, Neander Valley find as the type of a new species of human, Homo Neanderthalensis, the first to be named from fossil material. And that was published in 1864. Um, so that really put this Neanderthal find into the center of the debate at the time about human evolution. 
and I agree with King that this is a distinct species. I think the Neanderthals are a distinct species morphologically from us. If we look at a composite Neanderthal skeleton, we can see differences in various parts of the skeleton compared with uh, apomorphic Homo sapiens. Uh, for example, that wide and deep rib cage, a wide and flared pelvis, uh, larger joint surfaces. Um, and when we look at the skull and jaw, again, we can see distinctive features. Some of these are primitive features. So we've got the uh, longer lower cranial vault. Uh, we've got the large brow ridge, of course, the weak chin, all of which are, are plesiomorphous features, plesiomorphic features. But then we have distinctive features in blue there, the projecting middle of the face, a superiniac fossa at the back, distinctive shapes of the ear bones, large incisors at the front. So for me, there's enough there morphologically to mark off the Neanderthal lineage as distinct from our own and enough for me to continue to call the Neanderthals a distinct species. But of course, we and the Neanderthals come very late in the human evolutionary story. Uh, here from our human evolution exhibition in, uh, in, in the museum in London is a representation of maybe 7 million years of human evolution. We and the Neanderthals come really very late in that story. And geneticists estimate that we had a common ancestor with the Neanderthals, perhaps 600,000 years ago. So just as we can trace the Sapiens lineage in Africa over probably over 300,000 years, in Europe, we can trace the Neanderthal lineage back more than 400,000 years to the Cima de Huesos material from Atapuerca in Spain. And in terms of the common ancestor, I, I've said already that it seems now much less likely that Homo heidelbergensis or Homo rhodesiensis represents that common ancestor. The ancestor may have lived a bit further back in time, and I would say we don't know who that ancestor was and, and even where it lived, whether it was in Africa, in Asia, or, or perhaps even in Europe. And that Cima de Huesos material, so important, uh, a wonderful sample, um, some 7,000 fossils found deep in this chamber in the um, Atapuerca cave system, uh, remains of probably 29 individuals, um, most of them um, adolescents or young adults, and they clearly show Neanderthal features morphologically. The teeth look very Neanderthal. There are Neanderthal features in the back of the skull um, and even in the face. And this could be confirmed even from DNA. So we've got the oldest human DNA recovered from a femur fragment from the Cima de los Huesos. And this material, 430,000 years old, already clearly lies on the Neanderthal lineage. And we can trace that lineage through time. So in Europe, when we look at the fossil record, we can see the evolution of Neanderthals picked up, for example, in some of this material um, from Biash in France, from Eringsdorf in Germany, from Pont Neuf Cave in North Wales, uh, dating from around 200,000 years ago. And then looking at the Homo sapiens story again, Homo sapiens having evolved in Africa starts to disperse from Africa. And it wasn't a single dispersal, as again, many of us believed. It seems that there were multiple dispersals of Homo sapiens out of Africa. Who knows, there may have been some dispersals of Neanderthals into Africa, which we can't track yet. But in terms of the exits of Homo sapiens from Africa, it does seem that there were a number of these before 60,000 years ago. One of them may be recorded from this Apidima 1 fossil, uh, from a cave in the Peloponnese uh, of Greece, um, Apidema 1, the back of a skull is shown here um, on the left-hand side. And this back of the skull is compared with a Neanderthal, with Heidelbergensis, and with the Homo sapiens, in this case, group 5. And these analyses led by Katerina Havati suggest that Apidema 1, at least in the parts preserved, is a Homo sapiens. Uh, and yet the dating suggests, uranium series dating on this material, suggests that it's over 200,000 years old. So this really does suggest that there were early dispersals of Homo sapiens out of Africa. Uh, this is one which we just have this single record of. We don't know what happened to this population. Neanderthals apparently came back to the Epidema site afterwards in the form of the Epidema II fossil, which dates to around 170,000 years ago. Um, and the closest resemblance of Epidema I is to, is to something like school five, uh, a, a Homo sapiens 
Now, it is, of course, only the back of a skull. We can't be sure that the rest of the morphology was as derived, but at least on the evidence available, this seems to be a Homo sapiens. And possibly this fits with some evidence of genetic contacts between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis around 250,000 years ago, uh, which has been picked up in both mitochondrial DNA uh, and the Y chromosome uh, morphology of the Neanderthals. But the major dispersal of Homo sapiens from Africa, which Genesis will trace, which gives rise to most of the ancestry of Homo sapiens outside of Africa, seems to have happened around 60,000 years ago. So on this diagram, we can see a number of ancient genomes, which are early Homo sapiens genomes from parts of Asia and Europe. And within 20,000 years of that event, the Neanderthals physically had disappeared. So we've been arguing for many years about what happened to the Neanderthals. And here are some of the ideas on the left-hand side here. Um, we no longer think, of course, Neanderthals just directly evolved into Homo sapiens. That, that certainly didn't happen. But a number of these other ideas there, uh, the one I've tended to favour is the one at the bottom, that it was a combination of features, perhaps economic competition between the populations combined with unstable environments. Um, and the Neanderthals may already have been uh, suffering from some of those unstable environments before Homo sapiens um, dispersed into the region. And for many years, we thought that this move of Homo sapiens uh, out of Africa and into Neanderthal territory was also marked by really major behavioral changes. So the idea that uh, cave art uh, had this creative explosion about 40,000 years ago, the appearance of uh, um, statuettes, cave paintings, we now can mark those as far across as Borneo and Sulawesi about 40,000 years ago. So this idea that cave art and perhaps music and really complex behavior spread with Homo sapiens. But of course, there's now evidence that Neanderthals were at least doing some of this behavior. So evidence of uh, markings on cave walls produced by Neanderthals, of engravings produced by Neanderthals. Um, not everyone believes it, of course, but I think the evidence is strong now. And I would say that the behavioral gap that we used to believe existed between us and Neanderthals has certainly considerably narrowed. Some people would say it's disappeared altogether. I, I wouldn't go that far, but it's certainly considerably narrowed. And they show major similarities to us in, in certainly much of their behavior. And an example of that is this uh, structure from deep within a cave system at Brunichel in France. So deep within the dark zone of the cave, there are these enigmatic elliptical structures made of broken stalagmites, basically dry stone walls constructed from stalagmites, completely unknown purpose. Uh, were they living there? Was this some kind of uh, ritual structure? But certainly deep within the cave where they must have had artificial light. There's no natural light deep in this cave. So this is a, a mystery still to be solved from about 175,000 years ago. But it certainly shows the complexity of this behavior, which we assume to be Neanderthal at that time. So this dispersal of Homo sapiens out of Africa around 60,000 years ago was going to take Homo sapiens into the territory of the Neanderthals once again. And we've been uh, discussing what happened uh, when these populations met for many years. So we know that uh, closely related mammal species can hybridize. As an example on the top left there, the brown bear and the polar bear. Uh, hybridize uh, in zoos and they produce fertile offspring. Jackals and wolves hybridize to produce fertile offspring. Uh, a number of species of baboons in Africa can hybridize and produce fertile offspring. So I knew that this was possible for closely related mammal species and I thought that it was possible for Neanderthals, but certainly 15 years ago, I would have said, well, maybe there was some interbreeding, but it was on such a small scale. It wouldn't be typical behavior. Um, and given the intervening time, 40,000 years, we're never going to find any trace of it today. Well, of course, DNA has come into the story um, and has certainly uh, made a huge impact on this debate about interbreeding between us and the Neanderthals. So this paper from Science in 2010 was the one that really made the difference, as it says here, close encounters of the prehistoric kind 
The long awaited sequence of the Neanderthal genome suggests that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred tens of thousands of years ago, perhaps in the Middle East. As a result, and I've altered this to say most people living outside of Africa have inherited a small but significant amount of DNA from these extinct humans. And quite a lot of recent evidence about these interactions between the last Neanderthals and these early Homo sapiens that came into Europe after 60,000 years ago. So here are some of the sites that uh, have this evidence, and I'll just talk about a, a couple of them. So Zlati Kun, um, this is a, a, a partial skeleton of a female individual um, published in the last couple of years and from Chechia. Uh, the sp specimen had actually been known for about, I think, 50 years, but it's only recently given up per genomic data. So as it says here, she was part of a population that formed before the populations that gave rise to present day Europeans and Asians split from one another. Our estimated age of about 45,000 years or even older could make Zlatikun the oldest European individual with a largely preserved skull. As for Ustishim and RC1, and that obviously means a, a derived Homo sapiens individual, as for Ustishim and RC1, Zlatikun shows no genetic continuity with modern humans who lived afterwards. In other words, these are lost lineages of Homo sapiens that don't seem to have had any major descendants in uh, Europe later on. From Bachukira, there's a slightly different story. So here, as it says from material that's about 44,000 years old, this indicates that they belong to a modern human migration into Europe that was not previously known from the genetic record and provides evidence that there was at least some continuity between the earliest modern humans in Europe and later people in Eurasia. Moreover, we find that all three individuals had Neanderthal ancestors a few generations back in their family history, confirming that the first European modern humans mixed with Neanderthals and suggesting that such mixing could have been common. And that's confirmed by the Oasi specimen, the Oasi 1 mandible from Romania, directly dated by radiocarbon to about 40,000 years, although that may well be a minimum age. As it says here, um, this individual's genome has been analyzed and has between five and 11% of Neanderthal DNA, including large chunks on several chromosomes. There's an estimate that this individual's Neanderthal ancestor was introduced in the previous four to six generations. So even near the time of their extinction, there was still interbreeding going on between the Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens in Europe. We may have a similar story from Jersey, from the site of La Cote de Sombrellad. And we don't have DNA evidence from here, but we do have a, a dozen teeth that represent two Neanderthal individuals. And these two, what we thought were Neanderthal individuals anyway, actually on detailed study, show a mixture of Neanderthal and derived Homo sapiens features. So if we look at the roots, for example, um, they look typically Neanderthal. But when you look at features of the crowns, they show more features of Homo sapiens. So as we say here in this paper from last year, of the various scenarios that be considered to explain the mix of features in the Locotte teeth, we favored shared Neanderthal and Homo sapiens ancestry. And this material can probably be dated by luminescence on the sediments to less than 48,000 years. And so we say here, the likely dating of the fossils during a period of temporal overlap between these groups is consistent with this interpretation. But of course it will take DNA to really show us whether this is a mixed population of Neanderthal and Homo sapiens ancestry. And now moving on to much more recently published work. Um, I was involved in this work from Grotte Mondrian in the Rhone Valley of France. And here we've got a sequence of Mysterian industries and Neanderthal teeth interrupted by a sequence which has a completely distinctive industry known as the Neuronian with these tiny little points um, and a single tooth in there, which we can diagnose as that of a modern human child. So here's the Mondrian sequence. We've got Neanderthal cultures, Mysterian cultures uh, at the site for about uh, 
15,000 years. Um, we've then got an interruption for a short period of time by a completely distinct industry with no antecedents uh, in the region. Um, at about 54,000 years ago, a single tooth in there, which is a modern human child's tooth, and then a sterile layer suggesting abandonment of the site, and then subsequently another Neanderthal population comes back with a different uh, uh, Mysterian culture, the post neuronian and they're there for maybe another 5,000 or 7,000 years before modern humans return again with the Orignacian. So a remarkably complex story. As it says here, we report hominin fossils from Grotte Mondrian in France that reveal the earliest known presence of modern humans in Europe between, well, at about 54,000 years ago. This early modern human incursion in the Rhone Valley is associated with technologies unknown in any industry of that age outside of Africa or the Levant. Mondrian documents the first alternating occupation of Neanderthals and modern humans. With a modern human fossil and associated Neronian lithic industry found stratigraphically between layers containing Neanderthal remains associated with Mysterian industries. What the Neronian actually is, of course, is up for some debate, but these tiny projectile heads have been interpreted uh, uh, as potentially uh, arrowheads. Uh, that's an even more remarkable story if it's true. So these various transitional or initial upper Paleolithic industries, of course, have been interpreted in various ways, but certainly some people interpret them as representing multiple dispersals of modern humans into Europe. And we can draw these arrows uh, suggesting there are these links uh, where these populations have come from. And these are all imaginary arrows because we don't really have data to trace these migrations. And we have to be careful here. You know, there's a diagram here, uh, a recent one showing uh, the Russian invasion plans for Ukraine with these uh, arrows going into the region. Um, I think the uh, appearance of modern humans in Europe and the relationship with Neanderthals is much more diffuse. It's much more like this uh, artistic representation at the bottom that we've got small groups that are kind of interacting with each other on small scales, often for short periods of time. Um, and at times the landscape is empty and there's probably nobody there at all. So this is much more the representation than these invading arrows. And uh, probably we shouldn't have talked about an incursion of modern humans uh, at Grot Mondrian. I think that probably gave the wrong impression uh, of what we're talking about at Grot Mondrian. So all this talk of interbreeding between us and the Neanderthals raises the, the old question of the species, even though I'm calling the Neanderthals a distinct species. Why am I still doing that? Well. As I've said here in this piece from the Natural History Museum website, in my view, if Neanderthals and Homo sapiens remain separate long enough to evolve such distinctive skull shapes, pelvises and ear bones, they can be regarded as different species, interbreeding or not, behaviourally similar or not. Humans are great classifiers and we do like to keep things orderly, but we should not be surprised when the natural world past and present does not match up to our neat and simple schemes. And I think the main lesson here is that the, behavior, the, the biological species concept that I learned at school, that species are reproductively isolated from each other, it, it really doesn't work uh, in the modern genomic age. Um, time and again, when we look at the genomes of species that are closely related, we find that they're often doing a bit of interbreeding. And so what was happening between us and the Neanderthals is really not so surprising. Um, it may take millions of years for mammalian species to become reproductively isolated. At a separation time of 600,000 years between us and Neanderthals, um, there wasn't enough time to develop that full reproductive isolation. So a specimen like Owasi had about 9% Neanderthal DNA in the genome, as shown here on the left of this diagram. Um, other fossil specimens show levels up to about 5%. But as time goes on, as we map the amount of Neanderthal DNA in the European fossils of the Upper Paleolithic, that amount declines through time quite quickly down to the level of 2% that we find in modern populations in Eurasia today. But of course that DNA is still active and we know that it has medical implications. So uh, for example, here is uh, evidence of associations of Neanderthal DNA with particular 
uh, medical conditions in modern humans. So remnants of Neanderthal DNA in us are associated with, for example, genes linked with the immune systems, the metabolism of fats and starches, lung capacity, bone density, chronotype, whether you're a morning or an evening person, and the structure of the keratin, of keratin the protein keratin in the skin and hair. Um, and remnants of Neanderthal DNA in us are also associated with, for example, genes linked with thrombosis, Crohn's disease, lupus, biliary cirrhosis, rheumatoid arthritis, schizophrenia, and the inability to give up smoking. That last one, of course, remarkable because you know there was no tobacco uh, in the uh, in the old world when Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were were mixing with each other. Uh, but it's likely that some of these conditions are linked with the acquisition of the immune systems of Neanderthals, which would have been advantageous 40 or 50,000 years ago. Uh, Homo sapiens had evolved in Africa and wouldn't have had natural immunities to some of the pathogens outside of Africa in, in Europe and Asia. The Neanderthals having evolved in that region for hundreds of thousands of years would have evolved natural immunities to the local diseases. So we interbreeding with the Neanderthals, we got a quick fix to our immune systems. And that was good news 40 or 50,000 years ago. Today, the downside is um, in the modern human genome, uh, some of that DNA is causing autoimmune conditions uh, in some individuals. So swings and roundabouts really for this acquisition of Neanderthal DNA. But it's a lesson really in what happens when closely related mammal species uh, do hybridize, that this is a way for species to top up their diversity um, they may regain diversity that they've lost in their evolution, and they may also gain new bits of DNA evolved in another lineage, uh, which could be useful for them. So this interbreeding actually does have a useful biological function. So yes, 15 years ago, I would have said for all intents and purposes, we're pretty well 100% recent African origin. And now um, our DNA suggests that we are more than 90% recent African origin, but those other bits are there and they're important. So to coin uh, a phrase, and I think it was Svante Pabo who said this actually, we're mostly out of Africa. I think that's probably the best way of, uh, of describing it. So yes, back to that big question, you know, all this diversity that was there 70,000 years ago, now there's only us left. So why is that? Why, are, why are, by, as far as we know, 30,000 years ago, had the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, Homo luzonensis and Homo floresiensis disappeared, and we were left uh, alone to populate the planet. Well, look, there's many different ideas about this, and here's some popular representations. Um, bottom left there, climate change, iced the Neanderthals out of existence. Climate records gathered from stalagmites in Romanian caves show two extremely cold dry periods correspond with the disappearance of the Neanderthals. I mean, the problem with models like this, of course, is that that climate would also have affected Homo sapiens individuals. So why would it have picked off the Neanderthals alone? Um, top left there, Homo sapiens were to blame for Neanderthal extinction because they were better hunters and outcompeted them for food, a computer model shows. Um, top right there, uh, one of the recent ideas at the end of Neanderthals linked to a flip of the Earth's magnetic poles, a study suggests event 42,000 years ago, combined with a fall in solar activity was potentially cataclysmic, researchers say. Well, again, an event like that, and, and certainly there was a major disturbance of the Earth's magnetic fields 40, about 42,000 years ago, but that event wouldn't just have affected the Neanderthals. In fact, that would be a global event uh, that would affect uh, faunas and floras across the whole planet. So why was it just the Neanderthals that went under? Um, bottom right there, Homo sapiens developed a new ecological niche that separated it from other hominins. A new study argues that the greatest defining feature of our species is not symbolism or dramatic cognitive change, but rather its unique ecological position as a global generalist specialist. So we're able to go into different environments and through our cultural adaptations, we're able to become specialists in those environments, even environments like rainforests and deserts. And in the center there, a nice idea, I think, that humans owe our evolutionary success to friendship. Cooperation was the key to our long-term survival. 
So we cooperated within our groups better. We had lower levels of within group aggression uh, compared with perhaps the other human species. So I think these ideas are all interesting. And certainly the disappearance of the Neanderthals, I'm sure was not down to just one single factor. And of course, it's not just the disappearance of the Neanderthals that we have to explain. We have to also explain why the Denisovans disappeared, Homo floresiensis disappeared, Homo luzinensis disappeared, possibly Homo erectus disappeared in this time frame as well. So uh, an explanation that just works for the Neanderthals is not good enough anyway. We need an explanation that's a more general one. So I think probably that our behavior was, was probably the biggest factor. Maybe we networked and accumulated knowledge better, learned to extract resources more intensively from the environment than other humans did. And above all, we found ways of improving the survival of our children and probably older individuals too, to judge from the fossil record. As our numbers grew and we spread over wider, perhaps we absorbed some of these other species out of existence. So it wasn't just a single factor. And I think our behavior was a major part of it. But I should say, just to add that there is some genetic data that still suggests there were some cognitive behavioral differences which can be picked up in the genetic record. So here from a couple of recent papers, um, we suggest that modifications of a complex network in cognition or learning took place in modern human evolution, possibly related to other brain related vocal tract or, neuro cha or neural changes. And then at the bottom there, differentially active sequences were associated with divergent transcription factor binding motifs and with genes enriched for vocal tract and brain anatomy and function. This work provides insight into the regulatory function of variants that emerged along the modern human lineage and the recent evolution of human gene expression. So this is a developing area and one that we, we need to keep an eye on. So yeah, so I'd like to stop there and uh, thank you all for listening. Thanks to the Natural History Museum. Thanks to the Cleaver Foundation and the Human Origins Research Fund for supporting my work. Thanks to all my collaborators and my sources of data and illustrations. Um, so it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, uh, I hope you're going to enjoy the rest of the conference. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a really interesting talk. Um, and I think a lot to sort of digest for everyone watching. Um, so if you have any questions for Chris, please feel free to um, either pop them in the chat and myself or Lucy can field your question for you, or you can um, use the raise hand button and um, ask your question live if you'd prefer. Um, but just whilst people are mulling over that, I have a question um, for you, Chris, which is kind of uh, a little bit out there and um, blue sky, but it's something that always crosses my mind in these discussions of um, Homo sapien and Neanderthal interaction is whether you feel Homo sapiens would have perceived Neanderthals as a distinct species, especially if they're in low population densities themselves and there's a lot of variation within the Homo sapien population, whether they would have recognized that Neanderthals were something different or not. Yeah, that's one of the big questions. And, uh, you know, I wish we, we knew more about that. What we, although obviously we've got these very different representations of Neanderthals. We don't really know exactly what they look like. How much body hair did they have, for example? Um, what were their facial expressions? Did they smile in the same way that we do? Um, a lot of debate about the brow ridge and whether that's involved in social signaling. So things like that could have made a difference. Um, I tend to think that, yeah, however different we might see each other today, you might have to double that to get to the effect of seeing a Neanderthal. Um, but certainly, clearly, whatever it was, it wasn't enough to prevent actual mating. Otherwise, we wouldn't have our 2% of uh, Neanderthal DNA that I've certainly got today because I've had my genome tested. So I think it will be possible eventually from the genetic data to work out at least a bit closer how this interbreeding was actually happening. I think that's one of the, the key things. So were these friendly encounters where mates were exchanged? Uh, some people have argued that. Uh, was it something more violent? So we know that some hunter-gatherer groups today, some chimpanzee groups today, if a band of males runs out of females, they will actually raid a neighboring group and steal some of the females. So 
Was that happening? Um, was it the adoption of um, orphan Neanderthal babies or abandoned Neanderthal babies being brought into the group? So I think geneticists eventually may be able to get a fix on whether the mating is mainly coming through male or female Neanderthals. So that will be a clue. Obviously, if it were stealing Neanderthal females, then it would be it would be mainly coming through females. Um, but I think you know we really don't know how modern humans and Neanderthals perceived each other. I think what's interesting, another clue is that at the moment, we are building up a reasonable number of late Neanderthal genomes. There's evidence I've mentioned of, of a much earlier phase of introgression from Homo sapiens into Neanderthals, maybe 250,000 or more years ago. But in the later Neanderthals, so far, as far as I know, there's no evidence of modern human DNA going into the Neanderthals. Um, the evidence all seems to be one way of Neanderthal DNA entering the modern human gene pool. So that's interesting. Now, we don't know if that's because the mating wasn't going in the other direction at all, or was it going into Neanderthal populations but being lost because of some degree of infertility or hybrid incompatibility in that direction, And which can happen sometimes in mammal species when they interbreed. It's asymmetrical that, that hybrids in one direction are more successful in the hybrids in the other direction. So I think that's an interesting clue there, that there was something asymmetrical in the mating. And that might also help to explain even the disappearance of Neanderthals, because of course, if prime age Neanderthal individuals are being recruited into the modern human gene pool, that means they're also being lost from the Neanderthal gene pool. So that would be obviously bad news for the species if prime age individuals are being lost into the the gene pool of another species yeah yeah that's really interesting and i hadn't considered before that it only seems to be the evidence only seems to be one way in terms of um, interbreeding events i think we have a couple of questions so um we'll start with iggy sorry if i pronounce your name wrong is, is that me uh, the correct yeah one? okay yeah, sorry <laughs> uh, that's okay it's uh, it's a correct pronunciation <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk it was really uh, lovely and uh, so fascinating to um fascinating to know about neanderthals i wonder about uh, something about homo sapiens because we usually when we usually uh, talk about homo sapiens we we is uh, we um state ourselves i mean living creatures but however, there is one more term which is not very common, but also some uh, specialty in the in the field, uh, more, rather in the books. And this is Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, how we can differentiate it from from Homo sapiens, or can, or is there not any differences? Because uh, mm -hmm. last thing I I read, uh, it just one resource says that, and that's about um, Homo sapiens are totally the same with Homo sapiens sapiens. Is that correct? I have no idea. Yeah, so, so yes, that term has been around in the past. So um, maybe back to the 1960s, there was a view that um, most of the things that I would call different species now were actually subspecies of Homo sapiens. So uh, Bernard Campbell created a, a taxonomic system um, where we had uh, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, Homo sapiens rhodesiensis, Homo sapiens soloensis, and us, Homo sapiens sapiens. So that extra sapiens was to differentiate us from these other subspecies of Homo sapiens. But of course, in my view, the differences are, are more profound than that. And I think they mark off species differences. So for me, you know, we're all Homo sapiens today. Uh, we don't need that extra sapiens on the end. So I would, I don't use, I used to, once upon a time when I was doing my PhD, Yes, my first bits of work still use that subspecific nomenclature in, in discussions because it was around and it was a, a popular view at the time. But I think it's it's time is passed and we can now talk about Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, uh, and so on. Uh, okay, thank you very much. That was lovely. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there's a question in the chat uh, that I'll read out from Paul Newbone. Um, hello, Professor. A fascinating talk. Neanderthals had a slightly larger cranial capacity than modern humans around 1500 CC. Why do you think this was so? 
Yeah, so, yeah, that's an interesting point. So, yes, the average um, Neanderthal endocrine capacity is slightly larger than our average today. What's interesting is it isn't larger than the Homo sapiens that were contemporary with Neanderthals. So the weird thing is that if we look at the endocrinal capacity of uh, the early upper Paleolithic populations of Europe, uh, say the Cro-Magnons, for example, if we look at the shkul Kafse people uh, from Israel, their cranial capacities are larger than ours today um, and about equivalent to the Neanderthals. So the weird thing is that cranial capacity has decreased uh, in the last 20,000 years. So we've got smaller brains than our predecessors. And the strange thing is this is true in, I think, every region of the world where we've got a, a fossil record of Homo sapiens, uh, Australia, um, the Americas, Europe, Africa, uh, Asia, the cranial capacity has decreased in the last uh, 20,000 years. Now, some of that can be explained by a decrease in body size. And that's an interesting point. And when we look at brain to body size ratios, um, those early Homo sapiens, slightly smaller bodied overall in terms of body mass than Neanderthals, actually had a greater relative brain size than the Neanderthals did. And so do we today have a greater relative brain size than the Neanderthals when we look at body size. And in Homo sapiens, it looks like we've undergone a overall a body size reduction in the last 20,000 years and brain sizes have come down to go with that. And of course, that will make sense, too, because, of course, as uh, Neanderthal bodies, uh, as, as Homo sapiens females get a bit smaller, the pelvis will also get smaller. So that means that obviously babies heads are going to need to get a bit smaller uh, to to be successfully born. So it could just be mainly a reduction in body size. Um, and yes, it's true Neanderthals had a larger brain size in gross terms than modern Homo sapiens, but not larger than early Homo sapiens. And I don't think we can put any cognitive value on that larger brain size that Neanderthals had or early Homo sapiens had uh, compared with us. Okay, thank you. Um, I think John, was that you with your hand up? Uh, if you'd like to mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank, thanks, Chris. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you about, um, I, I seem to remember reading a paper, I think it was by Zil Yao, who suggested that perhaps both Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis died out in Europe, but Homo sapiens were able to repopulate. So, the, so there was an environmental factor involved um, that did affect all the human types, but only only Homo sapiens were able to come back. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, certainly there, there have been extinctions in Homo sapiens as well. Uh, and we've seen that already, that the, the lineages of uh, Zlati Kun, uh, of, um, let me think, Ustishim, these ones seem to have no uh, modern descendants. Uh, in, in Europe or Asia. So those are lost lineages of Homo sapiens. So extinctions happened in Homo sapiens. Um, we can see that for Epidema, that the Epidema individual is in Greece more than 200,000 years ago and is apparently replaced by Neanderthals. So I think all these populations, small in number, are vulnerable to extinction. The Neanderthals were undergoing extinctions and turnovers. We start to see that. Uh, Homo sapiens were as well. Um, and there were major environmental disturbances in Europe. Obviously, we, we okay, we, that cosmic event at 42,000 years ago, the cosmic radiation event was a serious one, but there's evidence Neanderthals and modern humans survived it. Apomorphic Homo sapiens survived it. Um, there were you know, major Heimlich events, a major Heimlich event around uh, 39,000 years ago where uh, icebergs you know, flowed down the Atlantic and even into the Mediterranean. So extreme chilling of the environment. Um, so I think, yes, these populations were vulnerable, Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens ones. And it may just be that the Neanderthals were smaller in number to, by the time Homo sapiens arrived, uh, this, these millennial scale oscillations that were going on, constant climatic changes. So they didn't have a level playing field. They could never maintain and build up their numbers. So 
as it got warmer briefly, they would expand their numbers and move northwards. Then those populations in the north might go extinct very quickly when it suddenly got cold, and maybe one or two thousand years later. And they had to start all over again, building their numbers up and repopulating. So this attrition, I think, reduced, it kept the Neanderthal numbers low, it kept the diversity low. And so when Homo sapiens started to come into Neanderthal territories, in a sense, Neanderthals may have been a threatened species simply from their low numbers and their low diversity. But the curious thing is that the Denisovans, and I haven't had time to talk about them, what we know of the Denisovans is that they seem to have had a greater genetic diversity. Um, they certainly covered, it looks like, a wide range of environments from all the way up in northern China and Siberia, uh, all the way down to uh, tropical and subtropical Southeast Asia. So why did the Denisovans also disappear when they had greater diversity? So there's a lot we don't understand here. Thank you. I think we've got um, another question in the chat from Siri Olson, who says, uh, a highly interesting and comprehensive talk. You mentioned that Homo heidelbergensis and Homo rhodesiensis might not be ancestral to either Homo sapiens or Homo neanderthalensis. Would you suggest considering Homo heidelbergensis slash rhodesiensis as one or possibly several separate hominin lineages exist existing pedi contemporaneously with the early representatives? representatives of the Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis lineages? Yes, I don't know whether I can get my screen back. Can I try and share the screen again? Let's just see whether I can get um, one of those early images back. If we can go back to the beginning of the talk. Yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, this one here. Let's see whether I can share that. Nope, that's gone to the end. Oh dear. Yeah, this may have been a mistake. I'll if just you, make one... um, go to slideshow at the top. Yeah. Um, and then you should share. be able to try it again. Yeah. OK. Yeah, let's see whether that will work. Yeah. So this shows, yes, the, the diversity. And of course, this is. This is only what we know of now. We didn't know about Hominoledi a few years ago. We didn't know about Luzonensis a few years ago. So there could even be more diversity than is represented here. But you can see just how much diversity there was at 300,000 years uh, running across that diagram. You've got Hominoledi, Homo sapiens, possibly Hydeburgensis surviving, the Neanderthal lineage, the developing Denisovans uh, or Homo daliensis. Um, you've got uh, Erectus probably surviving through that time period, the Florenziensis lineage, and by implication, the Luzonensis lineage. So huge diversity 300,000 years ago. Um, so yeah, it's a really complex story, uh, actual overlapping in chronological time and probably physical overlapping too. So in Africa, we probably had at least three lineages overlapping, Sapiens, uh, Heidelbergensis, Rhodesiensis, uh, and... Um, yeah, the, uh, sorry, yes, Rhodesiensis, Naledi, and early Homo sapiens in Africa. So was there some kind of contact interbreeding going on there? Um, we don't know. There obviously was contact between the Neanderthal and Denisovan lineages going on. Uh, in terms of Erectus, uh, it's possible that there's Erectus input into the Denisovans genetically. There seems to be a more archaic input into the Denisovans, which could be from Homo erectus, Homo antecessor, of course, we've just got this one record from Atapuerca, from Grandolina. Uh, we don't know how long the antecessor lineage lasted for. Uh, that too may have been interacting with some of these other lineages. So, yeah, it's a really complicated story and more complicated certainly than this diagram uh, represents it. Yeah, I think it just gets more and more complicated every few years with all these um, new discoveries. Or more, or more interesting. Uh, more interesting, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, if anyone has anything they want to ask. Oh, yeah. Um, so Kumar has just asked in the talk, uh, in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Stringer, for the fascinating talk. A little bit out of line, but I wanted to know when we evaluate and make the calculation for the size of brain 
exactly for the Neanderthals and other plosomorphic archaic species. Then do we also precisely calculate and subtract the CSF and Menange weight to actually get the brain weight? Or do we consider the brain weight to be inclusive of the weight of the CSF and Menange as well? Sorry, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and then thank you. Yeah, so yeah, obviously I can't see the written version of that, but yes, if it's about translating weight uh, from volume of the brain, um, yeah, I'm not an expert in this area, but there was a recent paper which looked at uh, encephalization quotients uh, in these different species and looked at body weight estimates as well as brain size and brain and brain weight. So um, I can try and post that maybe somewhere for the conference for people to look at uh, in the next couple of days. Would that be helpful? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll try I was muted then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was um, saying we can sorry. circulate anything if you want to send it through. Yeah. Uh, we have someone with their hand up. Uh, Andra, would you like to unmute? Uh, I don't think I can hear you. you. No. Mm -hmm. no. Sorry. If you want to type it in the chat, we can read it out. Okay, maybe maybe now you can hear me. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, us. cool. So thank you very much, um, Professor Stringer, for uh, for the talk. I think I wanted to ask you a question related to the Pan African uh, view of Homo sapiens Homo sapiens evolution, and um, I was curious about what kind of fossils would you label as plesiomorphic Homo sapiens besides um, the Jebeli Road material. So I was interested in the um, fossil evidential basis in support uh, for the Pan-African view, uh, in your opinion. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, so a fossil like Omo Kibish II, for example, uh, that for me is, is a plesiomorphic Homo sapiens. Again, I can try and screen share. I don't know whether it's a dangerous thing to try and do. Let me try and do it. Uh, I did have a few more slides at the end, which... Uh, may be relevant here. Let's just see if I can um, get the talk up here. Um, let's just try and go to the end. And um, yeah, let's see whether I had some stuff on the kibbish. Yeah, no, annoyingly, I think I took those slides out. But um, yeah, Omo Kibbish 2 is um, is certainly a plesiomorphic, plesiomorphic Homo sapiens for me. Uh, it does not have the globular brain case shape. It has an angulated occipital bone uh, with a, a torus across it. So much more archaic. And yet at the front, of course, it has seemingly no brow ridge. So a strange mix of features, but far less derived than Homo kibish one. Uh, they're said to be the same age by correlation, although I think that remains to be established. Um, Ungaloba, lightly hominid 18, I regard that as a plesiomorphic homo sapiens as well. Florisbad, a trickier, less complete specimen, I think that's probably a plesiomorphic homo sapiens as well for me. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but there's a lot of diversity in those specimens. Ilia Springs is another one we can bring into that uh, mix of uh, what, what used to be called archaic homo sapiens, now I would call plesiomorphic homo sapiens. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe just one more quick question if anyone wants to quickly type in the chat. But if not, I'm going to hold on a couple more seconds in case people are kind of typing away. Um, perhaps we can finish there. Um, so thank you again so much for your talk. Um, it was a really interesting and I think someone mentioned very comprehensive overview of kind of what we know so far about um, the interaction of Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. And I think an excellent way to kind of kick off um, the conference. So thank you so much again for that.
Um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing everyone um, bright and early tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, for the first of our conference sessions. Thank you all for joining this evening um, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. A pleasure Thanks, talking to you. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.